So I'm going to take you to, uh, through a quick uh, and pretty random tour of some artworks in public space, and I'll tell you why I like these works so much. Um, and hopefully it will connect to what Henk Oosterling said, the art as public space. Uh, and hopefully it will connect in different ways to the workshops you'll follow after this. Now, last week my girlfriend went to New Orleans and she came back with this picture. Uh, and what does this picture tell us about the place of art in the city? It tells you one thing to begin with. Art can move. You can, you can carry it with you, you can find a place, you can settle down, you can pack it up and you can leave. Uh, art also creates uh, rhythms and rhymes and patterns where they didn't exist before. So even when there's no sound, which is probably the most important thing in this work of public art, uh, you can look at the compositions, look at the straight lines and the curves. Straight line here, the curve here, the broken circles here here and here. I mean, even his tuba isn't perfectly round. It's, it's, it's been alive, it's been around, so it's been dented here and there. And then uh, what you see is this is a celebration and a rant at the same time. Yes, these guys love the music, of course. Yes, they can't help themselves from performing day and night. Um, but uh, they're gifted musicians and they don't have a regular stage. They perform on street corners, not in concert halls. And maybe some of you have been to New Orleans. Uh, this is on the corner of Charles and Frenchman Street. It's right in the heart of Marigny, the, the tourist district. Uh, and <coughs> one other telling detail is what do these cardboard boxes say? They say, we have no money. We need money. Who is backing us? Uh, Who is going to support us? Well, one supporter for sure is Hayes FM, one of the countless informal music radio stations in that city. It's scribbled on the window just like there's been scribbles on the traffic sign. Uh, everything about this image tells you the, the, the artist placing his signature in parts of the city full well knowing uh, that while the city seems ours, ours uh, at this moment, um, this will never last forever. This will only last until the police come knocking. And then they'll disappear. Another work of art and public space. This is Freedom Square in the city of Kobani, in the north of Syria. You might have heard about it. It was occupied by ISIS two years ago, and then re-captured um, by the Kurdish people of Rojava. I've been there, it's, it's a proud place. Mm, and what they did here really impressed me. You can see the, the, the town was destroyed to its base, but in the middle of the town, is this Freedom Square with the proud eagle. And the only thing they did was to uh, paint the colors of the Rojava revolution back on the bronze eagle. And they will do no more. The people of the city have decided collectively, um, while they're rebuilding the rest of the city in a phenomenal speed, that the Freedom Square will remain untouched. It will be an instant museum of war memories. So nobody will forget what happened. And I think this is an example of how a collective ambition, even without any money to speak of, can be every bit as powerful as a commissioned work by an individual artist who is afforded a, a huge budget uh, to serve the collective memory. Because sometimes leaving things as they are can be just as powerful a comment on the world as it is the world we prefer not to see and to gloss over like we do here in the West. Um, the total opposite, just as powerful and effective, but created in a completely different way, is of course the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, 
by the American architect Peter Eisenman. This was not a collective uh, gesture. This was the city of Berlin commissioning one individual to create something that would work, that would preserve the memory for all of us. And then we'll travel to Arnhem. And you know this uh, pretty uh, animal. It's called the Faced Art Farken, a work by Florentijn Hofmann, Bartok Park in Arnhem. And Arnhem, uh, very close to here, of course, was also uh, bombed beyond recognition during World War II. This city also, of course, commemorates the war and its victims in many different ways. But then this friendly giant here, basking in the afternoon sun, uh, doesn't appear to carry such heavy burdens. On the contrary, it doesn't seem to have a worry in the world. It's mellow and it's sweet and it's larger, much larger than life. <clears throat> and I wonder what was on the mind of Burger Zoo, Burger Zoo, the, the local zoo that gave this animal as a present to the city of Arnhem when it, when it was 100 years old. What was on the mind of the city officials that made this possible? Are they telling us that Arnhem is finally done, that the city looks in perfect shape, uh, especially the new Kulturkluster Rosette, this neighborhood here? Uh, does it tell us that we now, now should all just hang out and relax? Um, does this work in any way tell us anything about the interplay that's always going on between money and power and government and regulations? Does it tell you anything about that, that, that power system that we as citizens of cities like these live in? Or does it only say everything's fine, everything's cool, everything's innocent? Just hang back and relax. Now I'll take you to my <coughs> own hometown, Amsterdam Noord. And there on Eiplein in 1987, the artist Alfred Eikelenboom built this wall. And that's what it's called, the wall. It's part of his series, Utopian Models. Uh, very 80s modernist thinking. Um, and there's many things you might guess about this work. It could be simply an abstract thing. It could be a reference to the old dockyards that were torn down here to create space for new housing. It could be a comment on the urban plan of this new neighborhood, the first major work by the architect Rem Koolhaas. Um, it might also say something else uh, to the people there. The only beautiful thing about the neighborhood is actually the view on the water of the Ai River flowing through Amsterdam, and I will block that view for you. That might be its message. Um, or it can also say, guess whatever you like, but I will never reveal what the, the secret, the mystery that I carry with me. And that is something I like. I like our cities to carry mysteries here and there too. They can be random mysteries, they can be man-made mysteries, they can be coincidences, but I like cities to, to uh, keep some of those mysteries uh, uh, present for all of us. Because what I fear in the Netherlands is that our cities are becoming so comfortable and so complete and so finished uh, that it gives you the feeling that there is nothing we can change about the world that this world is perfect like it is, and we, there is no need for people like us, curious people, adventurous people, to change anything, that we should subside in the knowledge that we live in a perfect, safe world. Now, of course, uh, a work like this will always uh, grab the attention of people, like some graffiti artists here try to appropriate it by stating the obvious, yes, this is Nord, yes, I love Nord. So um, they know very well that in an orderly city like Amsterdam, the city cleaners will be there the next day and remove all their signs. So apparently they thought the best choice we can do is to, to, to uh, 
place something on it that doesn't mean anything but the obvious. On the other hand, a bit down this part, I like this one. Because, totally different thing, but if you tag the word keys on a skate ramp, what does that mean? The keys to what? Is there a door anywhere? And if so, what will we find if we use the keys to open that door? Or might that word keys be a, a wink at the great red wall that silently guards something, a view or the neighborhood or the urban patterns and has no door and doesn't need one. So this connection between keys and the, and the wall is something I enjoy when I bike past this place every day. Now, enter Laser 314. Also Amsterdam, a few years ago, uh, we discovered our own poetic Banksy, let's say. Mm, and if you read his work, there's a lot of it online as well, if, you, if you're not in Amsterdam every day. Uh, he never seems to be very optimistic. He certainly doesn't paint an easy, unambiguous, uh, comfortable picture of the, the environment, of the reality that he invades. But then again, can we be sure? Uh, do we know in this case, for instance, what he's warning us for? Uh, too late for what? With laser, you never know. And he's wise. He's young, but he's wise. He's streetwise. He, he carries no false illusions. Uh, and again, by placing a text like this on a wooden board, fencing off some construction work, he, he doubles the mystery. So um, all over cities like ours, you see these, these, these wooden boards trying to camouflage the insides of the building machine, of the, of, the, of, the, of the monster, the motor that is actually at the heart of our cities. Uh, and he scribbles all over those surfaces. So he draws attention to spaces that are supposed to be unnoticed, that we are supposed <coughs> not to look at, only once they are um, taken away and the new building has been revealed, then we should notice. Not, not now, but laser 314 uh, directs your eye to that space anyway. He doesn't lay bare just our human frailty, he also lays bare the urban frailty of the cities we live in. And laser is not immune to human emotions, he falls in love. And if he falls in love, love is a very explosive affair. But the love of his life has left him, all of us in Amsterdam know, because last year he shared his heartbreak with us in a series of um, tragic tags. And in rapid su succession, we, we learned about the fact that Laser had been left alone and that he was crying out for the women, for that woman, on all the spaces he could find in the city. <coughs> it was, it became so anguished, so painful that other graffiti artists started tagging posts next to his, like, "Yo, laser, what's up? Is your heart broken? Is there something I can do?" You know, they were supporting him, but he remained evasive. His personal life was all over the streets of Amsterdam. It was written across the, let's say, the, the surgery tables, the operation tables of the city. For a while it looked like the city was just as mortally wounded as he himself was. And I think that is a perfect example of art as public space. But inevitably, uh, even the enigmatic Laser 314 was also recently incorporated into the official art scene. So he moved from the street to the gallery. His desperate poetics appeared on shiny surfaces like here, very unlike the temporary wooden and metal surfaces that he had preferred so far. Um, so did he sell out? Did he uh, sacrifice his ideals? I don't know. Uh, I think his message had, has become even more complex than it already was. As is the case with Nathan Coley, Scottish artist who was shortlisted for the Turner Prize a few years ago. Uh, he specializes in equally brief lines like laser, but 
less tortured, less pain. Um, and in a gallery space like this one, his most famous, well-known line, the place beyond belief, seems almost superfluous, self-congratulating. It, it doesn't really add meaning. How different is the story when it's placed on the hill overlooking the city center of Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. It was placed there three years ago. And now, notice how Kohli doesn't tag his line across a building site like laser, but actually has the scaffold built especially to support his own illuminated letters. Um, and next to that, you will see the relic of the Orthodox Church that the Serbs, the let's say the occupying force of Kosovo for a long time, had been building when the war broke out. Um, they left the, the half-built Orthodox Church behind, and of course it, it started <coughs> rhyming with Nathan Kohler's work on the very hillside where people during the 90s had been killed in cold blood because of religion, because of their names, because of their ethnic background. And I've been there a couple of times and every time I wonder why don't they tear down that church? Because the, the large minority of Kosovo is now Muslim, no longer Orthodox, there's no need for that church in the middle of town. But of course, this is also a question of money and power and relationships. The international community that is still the main uh, sponsor of the Kosovo uh, uh, state um, keeps on sponsoring and funding based on the dogma of inter-ethnic harmony that they believe should be the foundation, foundation of Kosovo. Even when it's become a fiction and illusion now, they still cling on to that so nobody will ever tear down uh, the Orthodox Church as long as the international community rules. Nathan Coley sensed this, and I believe his work opens up different meaning, just like it did very close to my home again, Amsterdam Noord, where his work reappeared two years ago, at the place where the ferry boat, some of you might know it, enters, sails into the NDSM, there for the former dockyards that is now a kind of creative playground of gentrification. Um, the former dock workers who might take the ferry every now and then, I'm sure they will agree with the line <coughs> in its most literal sense, place beyond belief. Uh, many people, many citizens of the north who seem to get along pretty well regardless of their diverse backgrounds, their religious backgrounds, I think they would recognize something in these words. And, and, and it works especially when it's early in the morning and slightly foggy and you arrive on the ferry boat and you see these letters lighting up. It sort of it makes everything slightly unreal, slightly cinematic, so the, the, the everyday reality that you're used to suddenly is elevated. Um, it, it amplifies a whole borough of about 90,000 people. And, and still, I don't know if that is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, that is what you as an artist can play with. You can, you can illuminate or elevate the public space, but you can also make it more mysterious, more multi-layered than it appears to many people. A master of this is the, the, the Belgian uh, theater maker and visual artist Benjamin Verdonk. Uh, some years ago he created a year-long project with he, which he called Calendar. So every day of the year he intervened somehow in the public space in the city. Uh, and he was especially triggered by annual celebrations, ancient celebrations, but also new traditions that have found its way into our culture, like Halloween. So that is how this pumpkin ended up on the head of a heroic statue on an old city square. So the, the statue is a traditional figure of power, of course, of urban identity, urban pride, but it's been hijacked by a new ritual that has no meaning in Antwerp whatsoever, except for its potential commercial. Which is why Benjamin also himself ended up with a pumpkin on his head in the shopping streets of Antwerp, uh, deliberately self-degrading himself to a commercial gimmick and the shopping crowd either passes by not noticing him or finds it very funny, hardly realizing that they are now participating in public artwork. 
Benjamin moved on to Rotterdam, a city where very, very few ancient buildings survived World War II. The whole city center, as you know, is full of high rises and glossy, glossy business centers. And where among these icons of commerce is it <coughs> safe? Where, where could a bird, a bird is a commercially uninteresting citizen of the city, but inevitable part of the city population as well. So where could a bird find an untroubled place to build a nest and harbor its children? Mm. Benjamin found a solution, and then of course the question arose, why is the most natural thing in the world, building a nest, suddenly feels so unnatural when you build that nest on the 14th floor of an office building in the middle of Rotterdam? Finally, uh, Rotterdamse Schouwburg, so the city theater of Rotterdam, uh, regards Benjamin Verdonk as one of their own, he's one of their favorite artists, so they offered him their building to do whatever he would like. Um, so he was free to set up his <coughs> nest there, uh, and that faced him with a paradox. So suddenly he became a safe invader, a legitimate outsider, a subsidized outsider even. Mm. So he chose not to appear himself like in the in the earlier picture, but he he built a small sort of nest right above the entrance to the theater. Uh, it was unnoticed. Most people, of course, didn't recognize it as a work of art. Certainly not when he <laughs> took care of a little bird shit uh, on the pillar around the floor towards the entrance. This time. Nobody cleaned it up, even in an orderly city like Rotterdam, the city cleaners were told, listen guys, this is an artwork, don't touch it. It's supposed to be there. It was there for a month or so. And many visitors to the theater complained to the organization that uh, why was nobody taking care of the entrance to our theater? What is this city coming to? We're going down the drain. Oh my God, uh, this is even worse than electing Donald Trump. There's, dark, there's bird shit on the floor. Uh, what does it say about our cultural icon when, when this? And then they discovered it was artwork, and that made that received some really hostile reactions. So that's the only thing I want to say: remain ambiguous, remain adventurous, cross the lines that are placed in front of you. Don't uh, subside into the sense that everything is fine and comfortable and be uh, prepared for some very puzzled, uh, intrigued, and sometimes violent responses. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Mm -hmm.